if you've got any questions, we'll be pausing after each speaker and we'll have an opportunity, or sorry, we'll be pausing after each of the uh, insurance claims that we talk about to give an opportunity for questions. We are, I'll just share my screen. And today we'll be starting with William. William's an electrician by trade and is the current Manurewa Methodist Parish Property Secretary. And he's been dealing with the arson repairs to the Manurewa Church. So welcome, William. The floor is yours. Thank you, Trudy. <clears throat> so our church, Manurewa Methodist Church, is uh, located right at the corner of Alfredston Road and Great South Road in Manurewa, Auckland. Our church is uh, roughly about 100 metres away from the local uh, fire station, just down the road. Our church uh, suffered an arson on the 9th of September, 2020. The fire occurred at the front of the church in our main worship area, which uh, has a large window with a huge curtain that runs from the top right to the floor. The fire took hold of the curtain and the blaze went up towards the ceiling. Along, uh, along its way, it burned one of the structural beams, but uh, very fortunate, uh, the firefighters put the fire out uh, before too much damage uh, was done to that structural beam. However, um, as the fire was being put out, um, there's all there was all sorts of um, there was heat, uh, heat did its uh, damage. The smoke uh, went out, and there was a lot of moisture and vapor as well from extinguishing the fire. The heat, because of the shape of the church, all that heat channeled right right up to the to the top where all our lighting uh, and that heat just damaged everything that was plastic uh, up at this up at the top of the ceiling, damaging speakers, uh, lights, um, you name it. Anything plastic was buckled and melted. The smoke, however, went further than the than the heat, went out beyond the, the main worship area where the fire was, um, contaminating walls, ceilings, uh, curtains, and other areas, and the moisture from the from that fire that night um, also did its damage to we have a huge organ that's in the, right in the front of the church. We also have we also had three pianos that night. One was burnt, and um, the other two had all all of those musical equipment suffered some uh, sort of damage due to the moisture and the heat. Everything that was in that worship area had been affected by the fire some, some way due to the smoke. It was either by the smoke or by the heat or the moisture from extinguishing the, the fire. Our chairs, as you can see in the picture there, right on the screen, that picture there, that's um, after being cleaned twice and stored. And we, then we still ended up with that, the mold on it, um, and the smell on the chairs didn't come off. So it's been two years, William. What's caused uh, the delays to the repairs? So when we when our repairs um, started, um, insurance insurance builders they they were prompt to be on site. In fact, it was probably uh, the next day or a couple of days after the fire. Um, but from, from that to the point that things started, that, that took a while for insurance to, to kick things into to start. Um, but out of the fire, as a result of the fire, there wasn't, there wasn't just the issue that we faced. We, we actually found out uh, via some testing that we had asbestos present in the, in the church and all that purple highlighted area that's that wasn't uh, that's areas outside of the fire, but that contained uh, friable asbestos ceilings. We only found out 
because of the fire. And because of the fire, that's how we, we actually managed to find out that there was um, asbestos in the ceiling. So realizing that we had asbestos, uh, friable asbestos ceilings, we had already many years um, before there, the fire, we had leaks, roof leaks through the ceilings and that leak came through the asbestos ceiling. We had repairs done to it, we, you name it. Uh, we never knew that it was asbestos. Um, all that asbestos uh, remained on that head on that ceiling um, during that time that we utilized the church. Uh, we, we never knew that, but um, the fire brought, brought that to light and um, we had to quickly make a decision to, to deal with it and that we really pretty much had no choice but to remove, to somehow remove all the, the asbestos ceilings. So all that, all that area. So it wasn't just the fire that we had to deal with. We had to, we had to also come up with another plan to deal with the asbestos issue that we had with, within our ceilings. So two two years down the track, you've got to the fixed stage. You, you had your opening in June. What would you what would your recommendations be for other parishes to prepare for this sort of situation? I would say what we've learned from from our situation is um, have a have a team, have a working team. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone in a particular role. Um, it needs to be not just one person. You need to have a good working team that is ready to face to address any situation that you have. And that team, the other component to that team would be the communication having a very good communicating um, channel through to our administration, which is um, you guys. Having that team communicating well with our uh, main office is, is very vital to addressing and making these issues um, attended to quickly. That's great, thank, thank you, William. Um, certainly from my perspective, my recommendation would be for parishes to have their asbestos management plans ready. Um, as William spoke to, if you don't know, you could end up undertaking activities that actually put people in, in danger from the asbestos. But the sooner you know where the asbestos is, the better your plans can be. So that should something like this happen, or if you've got any planned repairs, uh, you, you can already take the asbestos into account as it goes along. Wendy, what's your point of view from insurance? So from insurance, um, that this this has been an, an extremely long claim, um, as you say, 2020, uh, two years, um, and there's there was a lot of factors that impacted on the time frame for this this claim, plus some other areas that have been um, addressed, but. Um, one of the things was that the damaged asbestos ceiling was only co covered for in the lounge area and a little bit of a part of the chapel for repaint. Um, and it wasn't for, oh, sorry, scrape and repaint. So that was not acceptable and the parish decided that they would want to remove the asbestos and then they found that there was a lot more asbestos in the, in the whole building than they expected. They were about two weeks into um, the removal of the asbestos for replacement with with jib board or, or wall board, and um, the first COVID lockdown happened, and so there was a delay. That delay, and then once the, the of course um, once lockdown finishes, doesn't necessarily mean that the build is available straight away to come back. Um, he's he or she has got other work they've already got programmed in, and also they've still got this one unfinished. So that that was that took some time, and then there's the air testing, etc., so that you can get get back into the property. Um, and the the um, the loss adjuster visits were restricted as well by lockdown. Um, but I won't say that the um, that the loss adjuster Perhaps uh, we're not going to point the finger at the at, at, at anyone, 
but um, they they are busy, overloaded, and lockdown certainly uh, impacted on on the loss adjusting company as well. Um, if we look at, at the lockdowns that Auckland Auckland were involved in over these two years, you know that the last the 2021 lockdown was 107 days. Now we in Christchurch were a lot of, <coughs> we were lucky and we didn't have COVID-19 lockdown like Auckland did. And um, once again, the builder isn't necessarily set to come back. And then and then there's the other the, there's other um, impacts as well, and that is on the costs. The costs go up, um, and also the supply issues because of COVID. Um, some of the materials come from overseas, and some are made here actually that um, seem to have um, large cost increases. So this is about it's about supply and costs um, that that impact as well. But the insurers never going to say, well, what's oh, oh, gone up? We're not going to cover that. They will cover under the scope of works. Um, if we look at site visits, I actually got our underwriting agent involved on this in this claim to actually try and move it along because it was taking so long to get things sorted. The organ is a really good example that um, that uh, um, in the future, where there's a fire, I will certainly insist that that's assessed early. I shouldn't be telling a loss adjuster to how to do their job, but um, that or, the organ should have that work should have, could have been completed last year. Um, the the other thing was that we we had a few negotiation issues with um, the loss adjusting company, and I wouldn't say it was the insurer because the underwriting agent was amazing and pushed. Uh, London, where our, our insurance is based, to move things along. Um, the, the interesting thing is that we now have a new claims manager who's had our claim for around three weeks, two to three weeks, and she's turned, turned it around already for the cash settlement that was received this week. Um, and another the, a result of that too is, um, and the underwriting agent also made himself available, which was, 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 Huge, uh, really appreciated in the fact that um, he could, he was involved and he was familiar with the claim and he's also got such a, a, um, a, a, a or he's very experienced in claims, underwriting and broking. So he's aware of, of all, all of the, the aspects of a claim. Um, and he, he came on site for us twice and um, became involved with, with changing to a claims manager for us. Um, I've mentioned COVID. Um, the other thing with this claim is that we normally we normally settle our claims in house and um, uh, where that where the, this goes above our fifty thousand dollar retention which means we pay the first fifty thousand then we the we would we would be handling the claim, organising the builder, following them up, etc., and being being in contact. Um, however, once the loss adjuster is involved, as it's over a fifty thousand dollar claim, I think it was first assessed at a hundred thousand, and it's pretty much up to two two fifty two seventy thousand. It's well over our aggregate, which is two hundred fifty thousand dollars for tw in twenty twenty. That means that once all of our claims for that year get over our aggregate, then the insurance company completely takes over all claims and we, we only we only receive checks really. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're not involved at all. Um, I want to talk about COVID security because of the, the fact that the, the, the building was damaged. Um, there was an intentional damage claim and that is once again, impacted by the fact that nobody was around because everyone was staying home during COVID lockdown and also that um, so there were a number of vacant buildings and churches are always uh, a target for 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 arson and um, being broken into because of the fact that that the buildings are uh, that there's no one around um, and that's that's just one sort of small or oh, well that that's one 
this is a good opportunity for me to reinforce the security that's required around um, church buildings that are that are vacant for some pe a period of time, and that's that the building's locked, um, the windows are secure, lights are off, alarms set, etc. And um, if you have a monitored alarm, that's even better. Well, just a quick thing on um, what we changed. We now have a dedicated loss adjuster for our claims in Auckland. Um, that one loss adjuster for, for all of our claims who I met this week and um, he's extremely experienced and e efficient. So we've, we're very happy to, to have him looking after the Methodist claims in the Auckland and surrounding areas. We're very happy with, um, with the loss adjusters, especially uh, the, the in other parts, of, well, in other parts of the country, the other thing is that we now have their, our claims manager at um, the loss adjusting company that is also looking after our claims and um, proving to be very efficient as well. That's fabulous. Um, we've had a question come in. Julie asks, "How does the inflationary provision work in relation to long claims like the Manurewa Church's arson claim?" Um, it works from, it does, it, 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 that's a really good question actually. So the inf inflationary provision is um, to ensure that your property has adequate insurance over that two, two year period because we revalue it two yearly. Um, we would, ex the cover for the claim is, if it is to 250,000, um, or, well, no, how can I say this? Um, the, the, this claim never got anywhere near the replacement value of the property, and so therefore, but the, the replacement value or what it would cost to replace this property is also has that inflationary uh, adjustment attached to it and also the um, demolition because there's a demolition uh, cost as well. So that inflation is allowed for and the sum insured total that we cover it for. Also, in addition to that, because this was so drawn out, now if we were to work with our dedicated loss adjuster and our claims manager, we'd be on the ball a whole lot faster, wouldn't we? I, I, I really like to think that's going to happen. <clears throat> and we've got a service agreement as well in place um, for with them too, in that um, but the reports are going to be furnished um, at, we, there's a timetable for that and also the, just how long they expect to, it will take to respond. Um, where you have a total loss, a, to, a total material loss, that's when your inflation is, is more likely to apply. But for this one, the, the building's covered for far more than this claim has cost. Excellent. I'll just remind everybody there's a Q&A button down the bottom of your Zoom screen if you've got any questions. Uh, we'll have another opportunity after we look at Andrea's case of arson, or oh, not arson, sorry, fire as well. So I'll take this opportunity now to introduce Andrea to everybody. Andrea is the housing manager for the Christchurch Methodist Mission, and she's been with the mission now for approximately eight years. And the housing division has grown to 100 uh, units that they manage, and that includes independent units at the Wesley Care Rest Home in Christchurch. Um, Andrea, tell us about the Tilford Street Complex. Thank you, Trudy. Um, our Tilford Street complex is a small social housing complex. Um, it's not pictured there. That's where they used to be um, located. They were a temporary village um, for earthquake repairs, but we were able to purchase five of those buildings and we relocated them onto this Tilford Street site. It's um, the site of the Linwood Union Church. Um, we lease land from them and we obviously own the houses. So the houses are quite close together on that site. Um, and the fire occurred in Unit 5, which is the bottom left corner of that site. Um, the fire occurred on the 1st of May this year. It was an accidental fire um, in the kitchen. The tenant had left the house um, when the fire started. It would appear that the tenant had left their deep fire on. So the fire started 
there in the kitchen. It's, um, and you, as you can see, has damaged um, principally the kitchen area. The fire's gone up into the ceiling space above it um, and damaged uh, like the roof trusses, um, some of the exterior of the building. Um, and then throughout the house, while the flames didn't travel any further than the immediate area, the smoke and soot has um, gone through the entire building. Um, yeah, so damaged the contents that, uh, that the tenant owned and yeah, the, the fixtures and fittings in the unit. So um, let's talk about that smoke and soot damage because, as you say, it was widespread through the unit. Mm -hmm. Was the tenant able to get their contents out? Um, the tenant did choose to retrieve her um, belongings, um, or most of her belongings. Um, the advice from the fire service at the time was that they wouldn't be usable, that they should be dumped. Um, but I guess some of the harder items she decided to take um, but yeah, they're not really usable. So even though they're not burnt, they're smoke damaged and uh, present a health risk because of that. Yeah. And what about content insurance? Are, are your standard social housing tenants likely to have content insurance? No, we find a majority of our tenants don't take content insurance. Um, just an affordability issue. So it's probably not seen as a priority for them and this particular tenant didn't have contents insurance unfortunately. Yeah. And, and what um, contents insurance would the mission carry in the social housing area? Um, we don't have contents insurance. Um, our um, insurance for the dwelling itself covers the fixed chattels um, so we can't insure the things that belong to the tenant. And, and speaking of the tenant, what happens to the tenancy in this situation? Um, because the dwelling was uninhabitable, the tenancy agreement um, ends pretty much immediately. Um, we didn't have anything else vacant in our portfolio at the time. So on the night of the fire, we, were, um, we put her in a motel um, and... The next day we worked with her to get to MSD um, and get emergency accommodation. Um, yeah, so, so, so the, the, yeah, the, the mission doesn't have a responsibility to rehouse the tenant? Um, no. Right. Um, thank you. I think oh, and just an example of soot everywhere. So, sorry. Wrong slide. What what would your message be to other people out there if they have a fire in the premises? Um, I guess the two main things that we have um, learned is um, that business interruption insurance would have been useful in this scenario um, where for sort of four months after the fire now, um, and the repair hasn't yet started and um, it's going to be several months before we will be able to use the dwelling again. Um, so that's, you know, a loss of income. Um, it's a loss of a social house, which is also, you know, an impact that we're very mindful of. Um, and we also are thinking that, you know, much of our housing is in complexes and it could have been that um, the fire damage could have been into other units, you know, like where we've got a block of flats, it could be that the neighbouring properties would have been uninhabitable as well. So it could have been a significant loss of income. Um, so that would be something that we'll um, have a look into. And I guess we're also really mindful that this tenant has in effect lost most of her belongings, um, even though they didn't catch on fire or anything like that, um, she's lost them. So we will be having, you know, really intentional conversations with our tenants about them considering content insurance now that we've had this experience. Good, good. Um, I just had a quick question come in. Was the house under private tenancy or housing tenancy, I'm guessing that is? 
it's a social housing tenancy so it's a um, income related rent yep. tenancy yep. right now wendy what might the insurance response be to this situation um <coughs> So business interruption is, it's always worth having and it's actually not very expensive. Um, and there's a, there's a consideration as to how much you need. So we, we would recommend that you look at how much rent that you would want, would need to receive to cover um, income for, his, for, for the, the, the entity. And also just how long, an estimate of how long it's going to take to repair. The other thing is that if it's a if it's a rental property, not a parsonage, uh, sorry, it's a rent a straight rental property, or a parsonage, um, where that income is is very important because if, if it's a, a parsonage, you're going to have to put the presbyter out into a rental property. You would like to consider temporary accommodation, so that the length of time that you you consider for, for the repairs of a of a property would would come into the factor as as well and you'd need to pretty much double it um one for the repairs and the other for the for what for placing the tenant and or presbyter and um another temporary accommodation and that it, trudy's um drawn up this this slide that actually shows just some of the some of the the time frames of the expectation of a time frame with a house fire uh, the first thing is the fire investigation um, that's usually happening while is the first clean up with the aluminium joinery which has to has to be cleaned as soon as possible because of the corrosion factor that um, that will happen and um, that can save the aluminium joinery having to be replaced which is a, a, a large cost so the insurer will want to get in there as soon as possible to get that done the, the the next thing will be that the interior of the building will be cleaned as well and during this um after the fire investigations finished and um and then the air will be tested to ensure that it's safe for the builders to come in so in this instance for for Telford Street there was um an engineer assessment was required because of the roof <coughs> the fire that went through the roof and so therefore the the engineer has to assess what is salvageable, salvageable, and I believe that six of the trusses are, um, and what needs to be be um, placed, and that will mean that he has to provide or she has to provide a design for the building consent. Um, in this case, so so already we're we're pretty much um, over two months into 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 the process, and we've only all, all we've got is the. <laughs> engineers design and then it's got to go to council and we're looking at another six weeks so there's 15 weeks um and so we're four months down the track and that's we've received the, the exemption from the council building consent which is really really good and it speeds things up slightly um and then the qs after the that design is is approved we would expect that um that that they'll be able to quote on on what they, their expectations are for the for the scope of works um so that they're what they've been wanting at the, the scope of works to be approved which um the mission is approved and so have i and so they can actually start booking in those sub trades and we can't take it for granted that they're always going to be available um and <coughs> this this um this job is not expected to finish this year uh, so we're looking for may to most likely around march next year for this for this property to be repaired and um meet council expectations and <coughs> um to be completed correctly another factor or to consider too is the christmas holidays um so yeah getting the council consent you've only as you can see you're only a small way into the project and um, these things take time so so that's working out how um how how to nominate how long you might need business interruption for yes, um definitely so what's the calculation for your business interruption the, so calcul yeah, the number of weeks that you think you require times the income that you're going to look lose and also a consideration for um, income or, or other costs that you're going to have, or the cost you will have to, to temporarily house someone, you may wish to add that to it. Yeah. 
So if we took a rough estimate of $21,000 over 12 months, so we're going to lose um, 12 months worth of rent, which to us was $21,000, how much would the business interruption cost for that period? Um, it's $2.81 a month and um, $33.74 per annum. So business interruption is, is quite minor against the income that you, you get out of it, receive out of it. Well, and you would ex be expecting to re a return, uh, well, your business interruption to cover $21,000 of lost income. Yeah. Now, um, business interruption isn't available everywhere, is it? No, it's not. It's only available on um, properties that we insure. So, it, and it has to be damage to the building um, or business interruption that 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 is for the building that we cover. It's an extension of the of the material damage or the building cover. And it and when you um, just an example of of a, a building being being affected that's not actually damaged could be the building surrounding it. Um, make it in, inaccessible then the building interruption insurance would, would um, apply. Great. So when a claim is activated, how does how does this work? Okay, um, well, we, we ascertain just what, what the claim is. So if it's an arson, we would definitely get a loss adjuster in and that would be the in the first instance we would um, we would call in the loss adjuster. The interesting thing is too is um, for floods. A lot of people say we need we need a loss adjuster now. Quickly get one. To, or we need someone here. What you actually need to do if you've got a flood, or if it's, especially if it's water damage from from a burst water pipe, is to turn the water off um, to stop any further damage. And that's one of the most important things because to stop further damage means. Um, to reduce the length of time it's going to take fix to, to fix and also the cost. So the loss adjuster comes in also on other claims where we have, um, we're not quite sure if it's a, a reflex, a good example of where we're not sure that it's actually an insurance claim. So if you've got a roof leak that's been leaking for some time and you've got the evidence of water having, having um, discoloured the ceiling panels or perhaps the, the ceiling itself, then um, or timber ceiling is a good example then um, that would indicate that, the, that that's been leaking for some time and it's been pretty it's obvious that it has been leaking because of discoloration. So therefore the, the, le the roof leak would not be covered. However, the consequential damage if a, for a claim where the damage ha was not seen because it was, it was um, dripping onto the insulation, for example, and um, it wasn't obvious, but then finally it was a, a, after a, a severe weather event or, or a large amount of rain then we would we would cover that for the uh, consequential damage from the roof leak but we won't we won't or the, the insurance policy won't cover um, deferred maintenance where ha ha there's been a leak for some time or or design um, problems or design issues I should say where the design hasn't of, of the roof hasn't adequately um, accommodated extra water that may um, pull from severe weather or high rainfall. So the loss adjuster comes in and the project manager for the building company is called in, the builder, and um, they come up with the scope of works that's, that's sent through to the connection office. The loss adjuster would be uh, would be communicating with, with us so that we can um, answer the questions or, or, or agree or pay and often pay invoices as well and also the building owner <clears throat> and we would expect the building owner to be able to speak to the tenants and um, and, and maybe close neighbours as is the case of Telford Street. Right now I just had some questions come in um, since we're talking business interruption. Um, so for a parsonage, should business interruption insurance be based on costs of rehousing the presbyter for the downtime until the parsonage is habitable again? Yes. Yes, it should. And it, it sh yes, exactly. So um, we well, have still because pr parishes still have to house the presbyter, and they're going to have to rent a rent a property, and um, so they're going to have to 
to house that house the presbyter. So I would expect that the rent, the appropriate rent, would be calculated at the time, the co or the length of time the project is likely to take. So this is a slightly different scenario than um, the social housing that burnt it for the mission. Would the business interruption also need to calculate in any bonds uh, that are required for a new rental? That's a good question. I have never been asked that before. Um, the, th the thing is with the insurance is we can never tell people how much insurance they should have or what the insurance yep. should be, but we can give them a guideline as to what 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 they need to cover. So um, so they could could include the, the the bond because they're going to have to pay that to, to go out to the market, the public yep. market. Okay, and um, David asks, are parsonages routinely covered with interruption insurance? I wouldn't say routinely, but a lot are. And that comes back down to, we're not the ones who do the insurance or, or ask for the insurance, the parishes would. That's exactly right. They, they tell us how much they want, to, well, the valuer indicates what the property's worth to replace and um, the inflation and also the demolition and then um, we, it's always a good idea as well to have some contents cover for um, properties that you rent out and the reason for that is because some of the chattels are actually um, contents considered yep. or classed as contents. And I've got one more question here. Does that mean that any building currently insured with the church is eligible for business interruption cover? Yes, but if there's a claim the insurer will be asking for evidence of a a, um, a tenancy agreement so they need to confirmation of what the the, the rent that's being paid and um, the calculation will be based on this so you can you can go in and short and short have business interruption for two hundred thousand dollars if if you want but if you're only requiring six months at four hundred dollars a week um, you're looking so, at at nine, almost ten thousand that you so, the company. So, for. so from the insurer's perspective, they would verify and then trust. That's exactly right. Excellent. So you um you mentioned that business insurance uh, business interruption was connected with material damage cover. That's right. That's correct. It's triggered, triggered um, if there's damage to, mater to material damage. For example, buildings and or contents. Contents are covered as well for business interruption because there might be computers that are required for, for work, um, which are and that <coughs> which are insured under our policy. So, is 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 there a cap or is there a calculation for how much material damage you can put on a building? No, there isn't. It's uh, not in our policy, but I think if it was a lot, <laughs> that, um, well, it's pointless having over insurance anyway, in actual fact. Um, you want it to cover what you need, you require, if you need it. Excellent. And as we've seen from uh, the case that Andrea showed us, the material damage covers the cleaning and the engineer's assessments and the demolition, the rubbish re removal and so forth. Yes, that's right. Excellent. Uh, so these are some questions that came through before we, we started our webinar. Is there anything you'd like to add about, um, you know, whether we can get business interruption if we don't own the building? No, but you can you can encourage a tenant or um, the owner of the building to get business interruption, um, but because they'll be be losing use as the tenant, even if you're sub subletting that as some of the missions do. If you um, rent a building, then the responsibility to ensure the building falls and under, under the owner. Um, hence, no BI cover can be put against a building we don't own. All right. But uh, so in what insurance do we put on a residential property we don't own? So for those houses that the mission leases from other owners for their social housing? So, um, and, and some of the social housing that is provided by some of the missions is also, also furnished. 
um, but definitely would like to see those contents covered. Things have a, a can go walk about. Um, the other thing is that I, I, I would encourage contents cover uh, because that covers the curtains and the car, uh, the carpet, the dishwasher, um, those light fittings. They're all covered under the contents cover. Right. And so the insurance on residential properties we don't own is general liability, public liability. That's right. There's a public liability cover. I'm pretty sure it's 20 million. Um, but if anyone wanted to know, I could tell them we have um, to, uh, told some of the some some of the missions. Um, the public liability <coughs> policy cover also has a cover for intentional damage such as methamphetamine contamin contamination. And the cover that we have is is two hundred thousand dollars, up to two thousand dollars. Excellent. That's the end of our webinar. If anyone's got any questions, fire them through now. Um, Actually, Trudy, there was a one question that came through yesterday, I think it was, and that was, do we insure leaky buildings? <laughs> Go on, do we insure leaky buildings then? <laughs> well, that's a very good question because um, we wouldn't insure a, a leaky building. And if we suspected it was a leaking building, we would probably ask for it to be assessed. Um, because what happens with a leaky building is if you touch it, then you're going to have to bring it up to compliance. So that what might be a $30,000 claim, say, might cost you $1.5 million to be cleared and um, create the new cavity and other uh, and insulation, uh, plus the design. You've got your consultant's cost, you've got your building consent um, and probably new windows. So that may have been just a small uh, truck backing into a building say so we cash settle for the cost of what of of if we, we did cover that building we would settle for a uh, cash settle it for the cost to repair the damage but not taking into consideration any compliance yeah uh, another question is there a way that the connection can help with parishes struggling financially with meeting insurance costs it's an interesting question because MCPC asked exactly that today at their meeting um, and it's it, the answer is actually there isn't a facility, there isn't a fund that we can tap into to for insurance costs. Um, and there are many parishes that are struggling with, with financially with meeting insurance costs. One thing that MCPC did um, uh, uh, discuss was the fact that um, that the parish strategy is re is really important for the growth of the parish for income, um, and 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 it's not always um, a matter of re of relying on any other funds that are available, and and the property development fund doesn't cover insurance; it only covers uh, building costs. And <coughs> so, the parish, you know, it's about the way forward for the parish, and it's about the future and um, generating. High, a bigger congregation and more people coming in and using the building and it, it's, 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 it has good, um, I can't think of a word, uh, <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's, that's um, far reaching isn't it, that starts yeah. reaching out further and then that's further and there's more and more income so yeah it's about going back to the book drawing board I guess and so far as the strategic plan for the for the parish um, and I'm sorry I don't have a checkbook I wish I did and also um, the, the fact of the matter is is that insurance costs are not covered by anything any funds in the connection office right Con I, in the connection we, I should say we have another question come in and um, this can be taken two ways. Uh, can insurance provide a parish with a William to manage their end of the claim or the loss? Uh, I take it we're not talking about cloning William, there's only one. Wendy, so can the insurance provide a, a William for the parishes in this situation? So a project manager, we would expect to uh, there to be a project manager f with the building company um, and you would have come across the project manager William for the repairs that were carried out by the, the insurance, uh, the, the builder doing the, um, the work for the insurance claim. 
we don't have any Williams. We wish we did. And I was going to have we chat to him about his future. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that also um, means that um, Andrea should be expecting a project manager once the the game's ready to start on her building as well. That's right. And um, the, the building company that, that is carrying out the work has done another art, um, fire for us and other work for um, in, in Canterbury and they certainly have a, a project manager that, that manages um, site visits and reports for um, dur during the construction time. So parishes might not have a William, but they will have a somebody when, yes. it, when it comes to it. For insurance claims. Yep. But there's also the loss adjuster overseeing everything as well. He's got to sign things off um, and, and, that's, and also answer to the insurer. Yep. So... Um, our audience and Wendy and myself would like to thank William and Andrea for your time today. It was most valuable. Um, I found putting together this webinar extremely interesting to see the different paths that one has it can create in different places. Uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and Julie, would, Julie Adamson from Auckland would also like to pass her thanks on to everybody for their participation today. Thank you. Any any closing comments from anybody before we, we say good night for the night? Um, I just have one, and that's that this this uh, webinar has been recorded and is, will be available on the website. And this is our last one for the year. Yep. So uh, for those going to conference in November, we'll see you there. Otherwise, we'll be back late February next year. Thank you so much. Thank you.